Hello and welcome to today's daily news analysis. So today is 9th of June 2022 and we are covering the Hindu newspapers daily edition. Now moving on to the first uh, news. So RBI raises rates to tame inflation. So what is the RB, RBI doing over here? It is discharging its monetary policy. And by raising the interest rate, what is the RBI doing? It is trying to squeeze out the in money, the surplus money that is there in the economy back into the banking system. So that would mean that there is less supply of money in the economy and that would that should help in taming the inflation. Now who decides as to how by how much rate should the RBI increase its interest rates? So within the RBI, there is the Monetary Policy Committee, so MPC. So this body is there and this has increased the repo rate by 50 basis point, that is 0.5%. So as to it believes that in the next year, fiscal year 2023, the inflation estimate would be at 6.7%. If, if there is normal monsoon, and if the fuel prices are near about the present situation, that is $1.105 per barrel. Now what happens if the monsoon is bad? If the monsoon is bad, that would mean less availability of food. So food inflation would increase. In fact, that is what the RBI says that chunk of the inflation is actually coming from the food basket. So food is important and the other thing is crude is a very important factor over here. That is why crude is mentioned. So here we see the RBI is reversing its policy stance. So earlier it was following the accommodative policy. That is the RBI was, you know, even though the inflation was increasing, uh, the RBI felt that credit should be freely available in the economy. Uh, relatively easily it should be available so that there is more economic activity that is going on. So because of the lockdown and other things, the economy had been smashed. So to improve that situation, it was following an accommodative policy. Now it says that we will, we are withdrawing this policy of accommodation in a gradual manner. Now here again, you would see one more term over here. The MPC retains its forecast for real GDP growth. So real GDP, what is the other GDP then? So real GDP, so the other GDP is nominal GDP. Now what is the difference between the two GDPs over here? So nominal GDP is kind of the normal GDP. So normally the term that you refer to that GDP of India is at 10%, 8%, 9%, that is typically the nominal GDP. The market value of goods and services that are produced within the geographical boundary of a country. So that is nominal GDPs. So let me explain this very simply. So it is market value means so price of a good and the quantity of goods that are produced. So that is nominal GDP. Now there is a flaw over here. What if only the price increases? That is no, no real production is taking place, no increase in production. So Q is not increasing, but only the price is increasing. That would also mean that nominal GDP is increasing. The GDP figures are increasing. So if inflation is taking place, that would mean the market value of goods and services is increasing. So that means GDP is increasing. So that's a good thing. But no, that is not. So a correction is required. Some sort of correction is required so that we can neutralize the effect of change in prices. So that is known as the real GDP. So typically real GDP is basically referring to uh, the price increase with reference to a base year, while the nominal GDP is looking at the price levels as of the at the present levels present year. And to correct this, so we get real GDP by dividing it, uh, you know, uh, real GDP is gotten by dividing nominal GDP with the deflator or real GDP by nominal GDP is the deflator. And it gives us an indication of the inflation in the economy. Now coming to the monetary policy committee. So what are the tasks? I think you can see, make out, make this out yourself itself. So this is the main goal of the monetary policy committee that is within the RBI monetary policy related functions. And it includes six members. 
three are from the governor uh, RBI, one of them being the governor and there are three representatives of the government. Earlier all the decisions were taken by primarily by the governor of the RBI but then it was felt that this power of making monetary policy should be spread out and the decisions are taken on the basis of majority. But yes, if there is a deadlock, if there is a deadlock, then the governor gets a casting vote. Now moving on to the next article. Satisfied with India's action, says Iran minister. Now we all know the controversy that took place with reference to this uh, OIC and the statement made by a BJP spokesperson. So here the Iranian side with which we are very much interested as to what is happening because of the geopolitical interest. We have sent our feelers uh, to them and they said fine uh, we are okay we understand what whatever measures you have taken against the spokesperson we are satisfied with it. In fact uh, very strong remarks have come from the national security advisor Mr. Ajit Doval. Okay. So this is there. Now Modi, Prime Minister Modi talks of long-standing cultural links. Now what are these cultural links and this is important for which exam? Prelims. And obviously India-Iran relations, a geopolitics of uh, this region, Iran. So that is important for GS2 mains and this is also part of India's extended neighborhood policy. So I was trying to find, this is the PIB actually. So I was in fact you know what this is also the PIB this is also the PIB so actually everything that is coming from the government that is the PIB okay so it was it, this was a state uh, this was a write-up by the former vice president of India Mr. Hamid Ansari so it was from him and uh, so this is what what I get so one is the commonalities between the language so and there is evidence of Avestan and Vedic Sanskrit being sister languages. Both in Iran and India are inheritors of civilizations. There was something that was preceding their ancient ancient civilizations. So we both have inherited that. Then we have the Parsis who live in India basically coming from the Persia. Then the Hindustani tradition, you know, we say in Indo-Islamic art so which includes art includes music drama painting architecture so in the northern side it is the hindustani tradition so indo-islamic and indo-islamic also means indo-persian so that elements of the culture of the west iran and other regions central asia has seeped into our tradition and that is now very very common to us okay so all of this music drama painting architecture it can be seen now here we have, uh, actually I was looking for this only, here we have the president of Iran gifting uh, India's Prime Minister the Farsi version of Mahabharata. And by the way, this is also given in your NCRT book. And Prime Minister keeps referring to this when he goes to, he sends a message towards Iran because there has been number of years because of the lockdown that movement has been stalled. Okay. So this book is known as Ramzanama and during the time of Mughal Emperor Akbar, this book was converted, the Mahabharata was converted into the Persian language and it was known as Razma, Razma Nama, that is the book of war. And likewise there is, now this is for you to do, there are translation of Ramayana and many other books, so in, including the mathematical works. Uh, that are converted into the Persian language and by the way Persian language was the official language of India that is it was the official language of Mughals and to some extent during the time of the British East India Company also that remained and later it was changed to English. Now what is the geopolitical interest and by the way geopolitics nothing to take load of it is simply geography plus politics. So given India's geographical location and Iran's geographical location, we have certain interests with them. So one, one is uh, this, you can see the Chabahar port diplomacy and you, I think it's amply clear from here, we can, it connects us to Afghanistan and from there we can go anywhere, not China of course. 
So this is uh, also known as the gateway to Central Asia, Afghanistan as the gateway to Central Asia. This is also mentioned in our Connect Central Asia Policy 2015. Okay, so one is this. Then Iran is one of the leading countries with lot of oil reserves. We need that. So oil and uh, there is natural gas also so we, na we need that also and for making of the fertilizers also we need the natural gas. So we were in talks with them for the Farzad gas fields which is very close to the Chabahar place. Anyways, because of this sanctions on Iran by the USA, our relations have been hampered because of that and uh, we couldn't really take side of Iran this time and therefore Iran was upset. So Iran is actually a very confusing neighbor of ours. Sometimes they are very cozy with us, sometimes they are very indifferent. So we never know but yes, long term I think this, this is how it is going to shape. Now whatever pipelines, gas pipeline etc which was to be go to India, it seems that it is going this direction. I mean, not India, it is going towards China. Next article, uh, this is uh, Delhi news actually, but I feel uh, obviously it has to be news of some place, but uh, it is important urban issue, very, very important urban topic over here. And this refers to land pooling. And this is the only thing that I want to discuss. I am not really interested in what all is happening over here. We are not interested in that, we are just con concerned about what is land pooling, why do we need it. So this concerns uh, GS3, so GS3 has the urbanization component. Okay. In fact anything to do with the economy is GS3. So the land pooling concept, you have the literature over here, I will just simply explain this, you can read this, I have kept the font big. So it is premised in either maybe taking village lands or existing urban areas. So you know, the, it is quite possible that the land is haphazardly given, owned by one or the other person. Like in, like let's say you are in Chandigarh or well established urban areas. So sectors are very clearly allocated or you may go to residential complex like apartments etc. So there are parks and everything, that's fine. But typically land is owned by different different people and they may not be logically arranged. So what can be done is, be it with the villages which are to be urbanized or existing urban areas if they have to be Im improved, this land can be pooled together from different different owners on the mandatory basis. This could be pooled together by a land pooling agency. So they will acquire all the land over here. They will do all the developmental works that are required. For example, this land could very well become like this. So same amount of land. So this will be the residential area. So apartments etc are there. Here will be the parks. Here will be the hospital. Here will be the roads that are passing through. So all of that. So the land would eventually be returned back to the original owners. So once the thing is done, developmental work, the land will be returned based on certain formula. Right. So, depending on the value of the land that was taken over, all those things. Next is again a local news, but it interests us. It is important for polity, Lakshmikant. So, I have included the static portion over here. So, Maharashtra, all set for council polls. So, what are the councils? And by the way, before that, I mentioned some questions before you so that uh, I don't forget. So first of all, who conducts these polls? You should know who conducts which agency. So since this is uh, the state legislative council or there is also the state legislative assembly, but in this case, we are only talking about state legislative council. So this will be done by the election commission of India. It is only at the local body elections, be it municipality or be it uh, panchayatis. So for that, the elections would be done by the State Election Commission, both of them constitutional bodies, Election Commission of India and State Election Commission. Okay. So here we are. So at the level of state, there are state governments, so state, there are two types of legislature. So one is the Vidhan Sabha, that is the legislative assembly, typical legislative assembly, and there are certain states actually six in numbers, 
who has a vidhan sabha and a vidhan parishad so parishad means council so there are two legislative houses like in the parliament we have the lok sabha and the rajya sabha so same way at the level of states so certain states have certain states don't have why why that discrimination that's because there is a provision that the vidhan sabha normally the elections that take place when the chief minister normal elections take place local elections in a particular state they are elections for sending our representatives to the vidhan sabha or the legislative assembly so the people directly by means of election send their representatives into this and council is for indirect elections will come to that okay now why some states have this council some don't have so there is a provision that the vidhan sabha that is the representative of the people of the state uh, can pass a resolution that they need a council or they want to abolish an existing council if if a state, certain state already has a council they say that it is waste so if they feel that they need a council or they want a council to be abolished they pass a resolution and that resolution goes to the parliament so now the parliament has to enact a law for the council to be created or to be abolished so thereby certain states uh, went for the councils some states didn't want the councils so thereby there are only six states uh, where these councils are there okay so this is there now we should know about the difference between the two so one is that the vidhan sabha has is directly elected so it has direct representation of the people while at the council it is indirectly elected so not directly elected by the people but through various people so representatives of the local bodies so one third of the members would be representatives of the local bodies one third of the representatives total representatives let's say there are 100 um, members in the council so 133 would be mlas 112 would be from the teachers so teachers would vote and 112 from the graduates and some members would be nominated by the governor so indirectly elected now one more thing um, there there has to be rule as to how much how big the council can be so for that it says that uh, it should be less than one third of the vidhan sabha members now imagine if the vidhan sabha is of 600 seats 600 members so one third of that so the council can be 200 but let's say if the vidhan sabha it's a small state so the vidhan sabha is only for 100 uh, members then in that case it cannot be 33 it has to be more than that so a certain minimum is set that is 40 members so minimum size is 40 but it has to be one third of the vidhan sabha members and the rest is same uh, as rajya sabha members sit for 6 years with one third retiring every 2 years and head is called as chairman while at vidhan sabha it is known as the speaker now naturally uh, this sounds to be very very similar to the rajya sabha that is there in the parliament so here we have the council so naturally a comparison comes between what is the difference between the rajya sabha and the legislative councils so here you can easily find out the difference between the two entities main thing is that there is no if there is a disagreement on an issue of bill so one is that uh, lok rajya sabha let's say lok sabha had enacted had passed a bill and uh, it has now gone to the rajya sabha so Ra rajya sabha can reject the bill all together but in this case the legislative council cannot Uh, cancel the bill cannot reject the bill and if there is let's say if there is a deadlock uh, the rajya sabha did not reject the bill but it remained pending for more than 6 months at the rajya sabha then in that case there may be a joint sitting of the lok sabha and the rajya sabha members but at the level of the state legislature there is no such provision so here it is mentioned i hope this is clear this is important from your lakshmikant point of view i mean the gs2 polity prelims in in fact recently if you see the mains paper even static type questions are being asked 
so so that is asked so i think uh, it's, it is not a bad idea to write an answer on this also okay now this is important uh, from the point of view of prelims and i think uh, art and culture mains also who knows so i'll tell you how so there is this uh, controversy that has erupted in karnataka over the revision of text books so that is i think very natural it, it happens only okay so certain people have been left out especially the local uh, local locally important uh, personalities well more of the pan india figures have been incorporated into the karnataka text books so we get some names people who have been left out people who have been brought in so it's it will be a good idea to read about these people who have been removed so they are in the news they will continue to remain in the news so akka mahadevi right so all, all these people we should know and the ones at the level the people who are include, included or pan india or more important uh, more well known personalities that are added for example meera bai guru nanak chaitanyas so in fact this was even asked in the mains paper 2018 now guru nanak also is a very very important theme uh, once one because of the kartarpur diplomacy and other thing is there is a theme in history um, history optional so there is a theme in history which compares guru nanak with kabir so contemporaries both contemporaries but guru nanak founded the religion that legacy remains grew much more as compared to kabir's this thing so there is a comparison over there also so that that is the theme from history perspective and if you see the gs1 questions so like comparison between gandhi and uh, ambedkar so such type of themes can be taken up here also okay so these are the things uh, which you should know about these personalities you should read more about them at least the wikipedia page the front summary till that it will be fine the ukraine war and the global food crisis i think we are well aware of this not so much but yeah we are aware of the food crisis that is there so this is the entire article i have just taken up this and i'll explain this with the help of the map so let's do some gs1 also so see this region is steppes and steppes is the place which is grasslands that is devoid of trees so grasslands and all these cereals that we have rice wheat etc rice is not very suitable over here but wheat basically wheat barley etc so these are grasses which which are edible grasses so they are very they grow very well in this steppes region and ukraine is particularly important now imagine when this war is taking place right when the war is taking place over here so this is affecting the supply of food grains to the world so about 6 million tons per month so 6 million tons per month of uh, food grains in the form of wheat and barley are exported by ukraine So that's quite a bit so that is exported but because of the war that has been affected and furthermore the eastern ukrainian region so that is predominantly under the control of uh, this region is under the control of russia and uh, the sea of azov and so this is the sea of azov and the black sea this region is sea of azov and black sea uh, this has been stopped so the export is not taking place over here so the world countries barring russia russia so the world countries are saying that russia which has which has been uh, punished with a sanction because of the war so that they, this country is weaponizing the supply of food so it is weaponizing the supply of food i can't see it right now but yes okay how that you have imposed the sanctions so we will affect the food security of the world simple as that while on the other hand the russians say that we are willing to export but when we export something because of the sanction it is very difficult to get back payments even though the supply of food or export of food has not been covered under the sanctions but because of the sanctions on the financial systems the international 
movement of capital or payments is stalled because of this it's very very complicated and that is hampering the trade so russia says that it is the sanctions which is creating the problem and not otherwise next article uh, by the way i left the opinion section today so there was one article on the uniform civil code then one art you, that one i left because that's a very very important theme uh, but uh, one is i have mentorship students so they are doing that the other thing is that uh, the uniform civil code was more covered more from the point of view of politics bjp what bjp wants this that i didn't want you to get into that the other thing was on the i indo pacific economic framework so i i don't want to touch that uh, right now it is it will take lot of time uh, so not really relevant it will keep coming we'll have lot of ideas on that so th that i left and few other actually so uh, don't worry about that so when that theme comes more relevant articles will take it up in fact our dna is anyways big today okay now i don't want to i'm not going into this but the future of indian secularism so this indian secularism is a very very important theme from gs1 not this article but this theme and you can read much better articles on the net i mean this article is good but much better content for a upsc from other sources so i'll tell you some themes that you should work upon so there was an art question that was asked in 2019 which compared the in and twice it has been asked comparison of the indian model of secularism with that of the west then what can west or what can france learn from india's version of secularism so india secularism positive secularism based on sarvadharma sambhav while the secularism of the west is negative in its this thing that there is the religion is separate and uh, the government or the state is separate so both have a different outlook towards it so we have to prepare it in that manner next article ahead of sowing kharif msp reveals fine so we are entering into the kharif season so msps have been increased for that i think uh, we'll stop at this now okay who reveals who decides the uh, msp and that was a question that was asked in the pre exam also so who decides this msp and what is the msp minimum support price that is the minimum price that a farmer is ought to get is ought to get a guaranteed price if he produces something so that let's say there are certain situations when the market price falls down specifically when there is too much of production of something in good seasons that happen so that would mean that in the longer run if the farmer feels that if the production is good then the prices would fall down so they would try to constrain the production so to incentivize farmer to grow more especially certain crops in view of the food security the msp was introduced and it is also for the welfare of the farmers okay so who decides this msp so we have a long list of things that are mentioned here so who decides okay so it is decided primarily by the government uh, but uh, so there is a body there is a specialized body that recommends uh, recommends the msp levels and this is then finally accepted by the government now it is an advisory recommendation i'm forgetting the name actually cscp commission of for agriculture costs and prices so this is the name of the body so this this, this basically calculates the msp it gives its recommendations to the government in this case it is mentioned cabinet committee on economic affairs that means the prime minister a finance minister and certain other ministers so they ultimately approve or reject this thing right so it is up to them they may modify it also that's up to them okay so this is this was this is what that was important so in the pre question they mentioned cscp and then they mentioned the cabinet committee on economic affairs so this was the answer or the government is to be the answer now the price the farmers say that it is very very nominal the government is claiming huge this thing but it is very nominal it is within the range of 1 to 7% so that is not much the food prices are really really increasing uh, there is food shortage then there is uh, fertilizer cost is increasing cost of production is increasing fuel is getting very very expensive 
So this subsidy is the MSP that you have increased is nothing. The cost of production, farmers say cost is very very high and the MSP, the returns that we get on this is lower. So 1 to 7% is nothing as compared to the increase in prices. Okay. So this is there. Then the government says, uh, Mr. I think Anurag Thakur. So they say that we have doubled the subsidy on fertilizers. So we get a fact on fertilizer subsidy, which is at rupees 2.1 lakh crore, which has been doubled from rupees 1 lakh crore. Now fertilizer thing is an important aspect of uh, UPSC, uh, GS3 agriculture. So in that it is important. I'll cover it separately someday. And here it also says government's philosophy of beach se bazaar tak or seed to market. So this is the vision of the government. Now India to take up the migrants cause at the international labor conference. Now where is this international labor conference? It is at the international labor organization. And what is the international labor organization? It is the specialized agency of the United Nations. So please, this is note down. This is very, very important. In fact, you should by yourself read it from the net. That curiosity should be there. In fact, I'll give you this work. Identify for yourself what is specialized agency of the United Nations. Why do we call these as specialized agency? Okay. So India to take up migrants cause at ILC. So Indian migrants, uh, Indians who are migrating, emigrating to a different country. So they have certain issues. So those things will be taken up over there. And one thing that is mentioned is social security, social security. So social security, social security benefits. For example, this thing is a slide actually from slide share. So social security in India, what all things it covers? It includes basic things like uh, minimum wages, unemployment allowances, Right? Health care, pension fund, retirement benefits, all of that. Now, when there are Indians who go to a foreign country, so when they work in a foreign country, let's say an Indian goes to Australia or any other country, so they pay the taxes, even though they may not be the citizens, they pay the taxes, they uh, pay the PF contribution, whatever their country has, contribution for health care, etc. Now, ultimately, these things, apart from the taxes, these things, should be returned back to the people, the contributor basically, right? This has to be returned back in the long run, like for like it how, how it happens with reference to India, where the people, some part of the salary is deducted in the form of EPF, uh, employee, employee contribution and employment, uh, uh, employees contribution towards the PF. So this should ultimately come back. But migrants who go to a different country, many times they lose out on all these benefits and it is very very difficult for them to claim this so that is what this minister minister of uh, uh, labor and employment is going to take up at the ilc 18000 pandits visit kheer bhavani temple so with all this militancy that is going on in jammu and kashmir in the recent times where the migrants are being targeted migrants and the hindu hindu pandits so the Ministry of Home Affairs says that this congregation of so many people uh, taking place very safely, peacefully in Muslim dominated Kashmir. So this is symbolic of communal harmony and brotherhood in Kashmir. Things are improving basically kind of messaging over here. Right. So, so th that is one thing. Now from art and culture point of view, Kheer Bhavani temple, we should know. Uh, Prime Minister Modi had tweeted happy. Jeshta Ashtami. So what is this? So Jeshta Ashtami is celebrated by people at the shrine of Kheer Bhavani in Tulla Mula in honor of their patron goddess Raganya Devi. Please, uh, my pronunciation may not be apt, but this is it. Right. So for this goddess, we have this temple over here and people naturally they offer Kheer. So we all know what Kheer is, right? So this they offer to the goddess. So that is why it is known as Kheer Bhavani Temple. Chinese activity in Ladakh eye opening was actually eye opening when it happened. So says US Army General. Now what you should think is why is this US Army General saying why do we have his statement over here? 
okay so this is in the backdrop of the bilateral army exercise that is going to take place in october in the high altitude area and the us indian army this is periodic thing that takes place sometimes uh, indian army goes to alaska where they train for high altitude so this is known as yudh abhyas there used to be malabar exercise also so in indo american exercise naval exercise so this army exercise is known as yudh abhyas right and this is done at the high altitude so both have Russia, india russia have uh, usa has high altitude alaska uh, arctic type region and uh, we have in the form of himalayas and we border with pakistan and china okay so this is there so this say, say, say that all that uh, construction activities that have taken place all the amassment of the people soldiers that has taken place so that is a worrying sign that what it is saying over here which is in congruence with india's viewpoint india's concerns now it says that usa has accelerated the transfer of extreme climate weather systems and different types of ammunitions like m777 how it says it's a kind of artillery gun basically so this they have transferred and lot of things are taking place also like this apache helicopter this p3 uh, p3i uh, aircraft it's actually a naval plane for tracking chinese submarine in the indian ocean region so we don't have many submarines so why not use a plane and see it with the help of advanced sensors so this very thing was actually used to identify chinese movement in the ladakh region and the Americans had no, they said that we are very surprised that it could be used for this surveillance activities also on land also it can be used. So this it seems they learn from us. Next article India and Vietnam sign mutual logistics agreement. Fine, India and Vietnam sign. Uh, let's look at the map over here and always you have to do this right. Okay, so China and Vietnam relations are not very very good. So I think yesterday we had China and Cambodia had some sort of an agreement. So we are now talking about Vietnam. So see this is the South China Sea. China is very very positive about it. And uh, Vietnam this region also has oil, oil, lot of oil. So oil tricks were there, Chinese tried to, you know, try to bully them here. So Vietnam feels that there should be some sort, within the Asian countries, some sort of a counter to China and it is... Uh, opening its arms towards India. So India actually, uh, few years back, India also supplied them with the BrahMos missiles. Okay, now they are signing the Mutual Logistics Agreement. So these are basically administrative arrangements that provides, uh, that facilitates access to military facilities for exchange of fuel and provisions for mutual agreements, simplifying logistical support. You, that you read for yourself. See, simple, as simple as that. India will be able to use the military facilities of Vietnam if required. If there is a naval exercise also, then they can use their facilities for what? For fuel, for stationing of their ships, whatever. And if it is mutual, that means the Vietnamese could also do it with reference to India. But naturally, we, they don't have really a strategic interest over here. They have more of the interest towards securing their interest. And they see India as the uh, security, one of the key components of the security architecture in this region or stabilizing force against China. Now, India has signed uh, these logistic agreements with several countries, including God countries, that is France, Singapore, South Korea. So all of them it has signed. India and Vietnam also share a comprehensive strategic partnership since 2016. And uh, since they were together, a defense minister is in Vietnam. So they also signed the India-Vietnam defense partnership towards 2030. Right? So for the next eight years, this particular decade, what all things they are going to do. NHI, NHAI uh, road laying feet enters Guinness. So they created a road of about 75 kilometers in 105 hours and 33 minutes. So road laying activity that was done is record breaking. So it is mentioned, it will mention in the Guinness Book of World Records. Right. So I think this covers the session uh, daily news analysis. So thank you for streaming in uh, to our analysis and we'll keep this time 6 to 7 p.m. where we are uploading our news updates. So bye-bye, take care and all the best.